Well, I have to say that's kind of an outlandish story, whether it was in the cartoon or the reading. I mean, a stairway to heaven? Uh huh. I asked uh, Jason to play a few bars of it because, as it turned out, I'd never really listened to it before, which astonished him. Um, and I think, and I looked up the lyrics, and I think they're even more outlandish than the biblical story of Jacob because in the song, apparently, there's this rich lady, and she seems to think that she can actually buy a stairway to heaven. Do not get me started on that. Back to Jacob. I love that the Bible is full of outlandish stories. Uh, I think June preached a sermon a few months back where she said it's, it's full of absurdities, and the absurdities are what make it interesting. And I love the fact that the Bible is full of messed up people, uh, which as near as I can tell is pretty much the only kind of people on earth, so why not write about them? And that way we have better odds of finding ourselves in the story, I think. And I love the stories of our ancestors in faith, the patriarchs in the Hebrew scripture and the matriarchs, although sometimes finding their stories takes some digging. But the digging is fun. And I think my very favorite messed up biblical character is Jacob. And Jacob has totally screwed up his life. His very name in Hebrew means cheat or heal. And that play on word, words heal, uh, meaning both the bottom of your foot and a person who's a jerk, is one of the few times when the word play comes out the same in Hebrew and English. The same word can mean the same things in both languages, which I find fascinating. Your mileage may vary. Uh, but that's one of the things I love about studying the Bible, the weird and wonderful things that you discover when you look deeper. But back to Jacob. He's on the lamb, and it is all his own fault. Y'all remember a couple weeks ago when I preached on the book of Job, and I said that sometimes we know why bad things happen to us. Sometimes we know deep down that we have put actions into motion that come back and bite us on the tail. And sometimes misfortune is just random. Well, Jacob falls into the former category. This is not random. He's on the run because he's created his own drama, and like many of us, Jacob has a bit of a past. Um, he's sneaky, he's contentious, he's conniving, he's got an arrogant streak, but like many of us, he's also complex, and there's more to him than that. You know, he's both cowardly enough to run away from his brother, yet brave enough to strive with God both a liar and a cheat, and yet a loving and sensitive husband with perhaps even a little bit of a romantic streak. There's this tender little passage in Genesis 29 where it just says very simply, Jacob loved Rachel. One of those rare love stories in the biblical record. And yet, even at his worst, Jacob was still open to a beautiful vision from God. And God came to him in this vision. And you've heard of Jacob's ladder, anybody? Yeah, it's his dream of a beautiful way to heaven. And those of you who went to Sunday school or vacation Bible school, do you remember a song, We Are Climbing Jacob? We are climbing Jacob's ladder. With little hand motions that I think may have been ripped off from the Itsy Bitsy Spider song. <laughs> Anyhow, this is just the beginning of a whole lot of wandering on Jacob's part. And there are, are several really interesting accounts about Jacob in the Bible for all his faults. Like I said, he's one of my favorite characters because I'm struck over and over by the timelessness of his story. And I see a lot of myself in Jacob sometimes. I see a lot of us in Jacob, actually, and that's a good thing, I think. I read a book a couple years ago called Sacred Therapy. 
It was by a Jewish psychologist, uh, Estelle Frankel, and she wrote, for the Hasidic masters, the entire cast of biblical characters lives within each of us, representing dimensions of our souls. And I have learned that when we go beyond our personal predicaments to locate ourselves in the larger story, we open the doors to the sacred dimension and our lives become pregnant with meaning, living embodiment of scripture. You're in the story. In other words, when we put our life experiences in a larger context, and that's when we find true meaning and the sacred returns to us. Frankel goes on, she says, we come to experience our lives as resonant with a much greater matrix of meaning in which any transition we undergo, whether it be a death, divorce, illness, disability, may initiate us into the larger mysteries of life. As we find reflections of our individual lives in sacred stories, we tend to feel less alone in our suffering. We no longer see our personal struggles as simply personal. Instead, we see them as mirrors of sacred processes that occur at all levels of creation at all times. And I will add, at all places. And by locating ourselves in the crucible of the bigger picture, we're guided on a journey of transformation. So what's the meaning of this story of Jacob and his stairway to heaven, his journey of change, and how does that locate us in the bigger picture of God's story? Well, Jacob was on a voyage of transformation at a really pivotal moment in his life, and he was journeying to a new land and a new life that was pretty much guaranteed to be filled with uncertainty and change. And in this time of evolution and transformation, what is the first thing he encounters? A ladder or stairway to heaven with angels ascending and descending. And by the way, I know all the angels in the uh, cartoon looked fairly butch, but I will remind you that angels are non-binary. <laughs> Just saying. But so there's this stairway between earth and heaven, a connection between the human and the divine. And that ladder, that pathway, serves as a reminder of God's presence in the midst of change and transition. And just as Jacob was embarking on a new journey, we are constantly facing seasons of change, whether in our personal lives, our communities, or the whole world at large. And that ladder reminds us that God is with us in our journeys every step of the way, offering guidance and comfort and a sense of continuity amidst life's uncertainties. And I think one of the things this story does is to encourage us to view these transformations as opportunities to experience the divine in unexpected places. In the words of a friend, the kindness of a stranger, or the beauty of nature. And we need to remember always that the sacred can manifest in the ordinary. Now, as many of you know, because I never shut up about it, uh, when I was in seminary, I spent a summer on an archaeological dig in Jordan. And, and at the end of the summer, we traveled to Israel and spent a few weeks there. And we hit all the usual sacred tourist attractions and places, but we also spent a lot of time with local archeologists checking out interesting digs and sites. And because I have always been fascinated with the stories of Jacob, I really wanted to visit Bethel, which is what Jacob called this place where he had uh, his vision of the ladder to heaven. And I was very disappointed when my professor informed me that A, no one has ever determined with certainty where Bethel was, which did, does not stop people in various places from saying, it was here, come, come to this spot. And B, all of the likely spots had been checked out and there is absolutely no archeological record of a stairway to heaven anywhere. <laughs> 
<laughs> so sad. But over time, I've come to understand that that's not really a problem for me because it turns out I don't actually need a stairway to heaven. We don't need one. I think what Jacob was supposed to take from that strange encounter is that the connection between the human and the divine, that path to the sacred dimension is actually wherever we lay our heads. And Jacob's ladder reminds us that God's love and presence transcends boundaries of culture, nationality, social status, sexuality, identity, and it isn't limited to any single place or group of people. It also probably isn't limited to any particular religion. And it spans the gap between heaven and earth everywhere on earth. And in the gospel, according to Luke, Jesus affirms this. When his adversaries tried to trip him up by asking when the dominion of God would come, Jesus tells them it's not coming the way they think it will. They're not going to find it by looking for a place. And he says to them, the dominion of God is within you. And the dominion of God is everywhere we are. And it has absolutely nothing to do with a heavenly afterlife, pie in the sky by and by. Rather, it has everything to do with Jesus' vision for a transformed society and spirituality in the here and now. It's not about getting on a stairway to heaven. It's about co-creating with God, the dominion of God here on earth. It's not up there. It's been right here all along. There's a line from a T.S. Eliot poem. He says, we shall not cease from exploration and at the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place again for the first time. In all of Jacob's journeys, in all of his transformations, in all of our life journeys and changes and explorations, no matter how far we travel or where our journeys take us, the way to God's realm is always with us. And the end of our journey is back at the beginning. And when we arrive there at last, we will recognize that heaven has been among us and within us, available to us, the whole time. Amen. Surely the